Hi, everyone. Welcome to a, another KE Report featured webinar. This webinar we are hosting with SK Mining. My name is Corey Fleck. I'm your host over at the KE Report, also your host and moderator here for this webinar. This webinar is being produced in conjunction with Focus Communications. Now, I do have on this webinar, Quentin Henney, Technical Advisor and Director, as well as John Decker, Vice President of Exploration. John, Quentin, I will get you guys to fire up your videos and your audios here. Now, SK Mining is traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol ESK and on the OTCQX under the symbol ESKYF. This presentation is going to be very much an overview of the company, a bit of history on the project, and a big focus on the exploration plans for this year. You can all send in your questions. Please use the chat or Q&A feature. I will be monitoring those throughout the webinar and interjecting questions when they fit in with the slide deck, as well as a bit of a Q&A at the end of this webinar. If you're watching the replay of the webinar and you have any follow-up questions, you can always email me, fleck at kereport.com, and I will get the team over at SK Mining to address those in subsequent interviews. John, Quentin, take it away, guys. Let's learn a little bit more about SK Mining, please. Thank you very much, Corey. Look, I, I have my camera on, but the little window shows up black right now, so I don't know if you can see me or not. You're coming not. through to me, Quentin. Okay, cool. All right, so it's just on my end. <laughs> Um, look, I'm going to introduce the company, and then uh, John's going to really give you the, the meat on the technical side, especially about what we're planning on doing this season. We literally just finished uh, our final planning uh, session yesterday in preparation for the, uh, mobilization to site. You'll, you'll see uh, here shortly, John and team are, are actually headed to site uh, literally within hours now. So. Uh, it's exciting to be able to tell you this story. Got to start with the disclaimer, of course. Uh, this is part of the updated corporate deck and will be posted on our website. You guys are really getting to see this thing for the first time. Uh, the, the current uh, stock uh, price, you know, it's taken a bit of a hit. So that's a bit dated. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, it's been her route, guys. I, I don't know what to tell folks, but it is uh, very disheartening when the mining industry kind of gets uh throttle like this alongside the greater markets uh really no fault of our own uh this is an exceptional story i think as the gold space rebounds like most of us know it will on the back of uh you know the next round of quantitative easing or whatever they're going to throw at us uh after they destroy the economy uh i think gold will do very well and this story above all should be one of those that really comes out of the gate uh, in very good shape. So, you know, if anything, it's a buying opportunity. You can see here we got 170 million shares out, fully dilute to a little over 200. Uh, the, the market cap is actually around, uh, th I think today's price is more like 330 or 40, something like that. Uh, we just, just did a financing. So we do have about 9.6 million in the bank. We have quite a few uh, warrants that expire that were part of financings done in uh, 2020 that expire here in uh, June and then in August. And those will bring in quite a few proceeds that will uh, round out the balance of the monies that are needed for this season's drilling. Okay, you can see here the team, uh, Mac Balcom is uh, CEO. Uh, we have uh, several directors all very close to Mac. Uh, Rob in particular has, has taken on uh, a role as, as the CFO as well here. This is uh, this needs to be updated, it looks like. But uh, myself, I'm a technical advisor, Tom Weiss, who I've worked with for many years. Uh, he was chief geophysicist at Newmont. Uh, he uh, is running our geophysics, and there is a lot of geophysical uh, basis for the targets we're testing here. So it's very critical to have somebody like him, delight to work with him. And then John DeDecker. Uh, John is postdoc from Colorado School of Mines. I've known John now for about five or six years. Uh, he did work with me previously on some projects, uh, but when it came time to look for a quality management we could bring into this story, somebody who, who knows the VMS exploration strategy and really could implement things, uh, John was the perfect candidate. We're delighted to have him as our vice president of exploration. Uh, you can see we've added some new uh, members to our geologic team. Uh, these are folks mainly out of the Colorado School of Mines. 
Uh, we have uh, Ben Freeman, Samuel Pierre. Uh, we have Jesse Hill and then Ori Wyatt. Basically a, a first crack, uh, first top-notch team, uh, Cracker Jack team is what I meant to say, that can uh, undertake this exploration program. I think this year above last year, we, we do have uh, more breadth to our staff. And that's important because we have a lot of boots on the ground work we want to get done. You'll see here shortly. Uh, and, and these guys like Ben are very, very sharp in the field at, at getting out, prospecting, identifying targets very quickly and helping us move those forward to, uh, to drill targets, to, to drill stage. So it's a delight to have the new team. Uh, we are exploring four precious metal rich VMS targets. There are other targets in the region around here. We've got porphyries, you know, porphyry copper gold. We've got uh, the very high grade epizonal style of mineralization at the Bruchek mine. Uh, but we are looking for that SK Creek style of mineralization on our 52,600 hectare property. You know, so we, we have a commanding position uh, within the Golden Triangle, and we have most of the prospective ground for the, the these VMS targets. And that's very important. Anybody that knows VMS targets know they occur in camps. And we basically have the, the prospective ground that surrounds the old SK Creek mine. And we, we have probably 85% of that prospective ground for uh, VMX exploration. Uh, we're located in BC in the Golden Triangle Mining Friendly. You can see we have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, one, one thing I might add is that uh, Seabridge and SK have worked out agreement to, to start uh, building the road across the property that goes over to Seabridge's uh, KSM project. And that work is beginning this year. It was supposed to begin last year COVID and some other issues delayed it, but this year it's going to begin in earnest. It is a three-stage program. We're going to see stage one go in, and it goes right next to uh, our our Sibululu area. So uh, a lot of people ask, why aren't you drilling at Sibululu? You know, why? well, we're going to wait until we have that road in place, and that's going to make uh, exploration in that area very, very cheap uh, going forward. So that's uh, part of the, the strategy we have here. Uh, look, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about a couple more things and hand it off to John here. Look, uh, we do have about 526 square kilometers of ground. Uh, I think it's very important for people to understand we are right in the middle of a, a large number of world class deposits of various types. Now, SK Creek, which is in the north, is a historic VMS, a very high grade VMS uh, deposit. It was mined by Homestake, then Barrick. Uh, now it belongs to Skeena. Skeena is looking to develop the, the lower grades, not necessarily low grade, but lower grade parts of the system, which mount to over 5 million ounces of gold. Uh, it will be a large scale mine. I think the, the PFS that they delivered last year indicates it should produce north of 400,000 ounces of gold. So that's a, a major project in its own right. But you also have the Kerr Sulfurets Mitchell uh, Porphyry Field off to the east that is one of if not the biggest porphyry copper gold systems in north america it is not currently developed but like i said seabridge is now making uh advancements to to move that towards production you have the treaty creek discovery up there in the the kind of the northeast treaty creek of course is tudor uh they've reached uh, an amazing milestone of something around 25 or 30 million ounces i believe in resource at present uh, and then you have the, the Bruce Jack mine, which is now Newcrest. Newcrest owns that. And it's an extremely high-grade uh, bulk underground mine that is uh, on a system that's, we'll call it, a little different than just about anything on Earth. It's a, a kind of an epizonal. Uh, it's debatable, but it's an epizonal or perhaps even uh, epithermal uh, gold system, very high-grade in nature. We are going to focus on... The VMS, so guys, uh, you can see SK Creek. There's a belt that trends north south through here. It basically is is a, a paleo grobin that would have been on the seafloor. What does that mean? It means that there was a valley present in the seafloor environment, and it was along that valley that we had a number of VMS systems established. Okay, so on the seafloor right now, you can go down in the submarine, you can see uh, black smokers in clusters in certain areas, like the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And they occur in in discrete uh, structural zones, usually valleys, like uh, you know, underlain by faulting and stuff like that, that allows the hot waters to come to surface. Okay, so we think uh, based on the geology and the distribution of 
of the prospects that we found, we think we have about 85% of the prospective ground for VMS on our property. That's very, very important. Uh, last year, we recognized some very high quality targets at Vermilion and Scar Scarlet Ridge. I will let John talk about those here in a minute. But you know, even to this day, the point is we are turning up new targets, identifying new uh, drill drill targets and new occurrences of these VMS. Uh, even even now, even though this camp has you know been uh, been in operation now for thirty odd years. Okay, uh, John, I will let you uh, direct it. If you want me to move the slides, I can, or you can do it yourself. I've got it. Thank you, Quentin. So as Quentin uh, was discussing, uh, SK is looking for our precious metal VMS deposits. And uh, this chart is one that I've had in several of my technical presentations. And it just shows the deposit tonnage on the um, horizontal axis and millions of metric tons and gold grade on the vertical axis. And uh, what we want to focus on is SK Creek uh, VMS deposit uh, there in the uh, red oval, that was when it was um, operating the highest grade gold mine on the planet. And uh, we can see about uh, these high grade VMS deposits, they're relatively modest tonnage, uh, but they're very high grade, which means, um, you know, with a small amount of um, mining or tonnage, you can get quite a bit of gold. As you see, over 100 tons of gold came from the SK Creek deposit itself. Another thing I would like to point out is a lot of these other gold rich VMS deposits uh, like the Horn deposit and uh, the Bousquet deposit, um, those are in the Abitibi district. And this is a well-known district uh, within Eastern Canada. And a case in point that these VMS deposits do occur in clusters. Um, so it would be very unusual for something like SK Creek to be by itself. It's just really not geologically plausible that a uh, world-class deposit would form by itself like that. So I kind of want to go over the history of the exploration on the property. Uh, people have been working up here for about 120 years or so. Um, Cumberland is the first VMS prospect found on our property. And at that point, people really didn't know what VMS was. Uh, however, there was some gold exploration going on in the early 20th century um, in earnest, starting with Tom Mackay in the 1930s. And here's the first one that identified the prospectivity of the, the SK Creek area itself. But it wasn't until 1988 that um, the actual deposit itself was found with uh, the, the famous hole 109. Uh, so that was in 1988, and that really got a lot of the exploration in this area um, going in earnest uh, by that point. And from 1990 to 2006, there's been quite a bit of exploration on our property. A lot of the showings uh, that we um, have on this map and that we're exploring today were located in the early 1990s. However, um, there really was a big disconnect between prospecting versus doing economic geology, where you actually understand the hydrothermal system and the stratigraphy uh, that you're dealing with to truly vector towards these deposits. That was something that really wasn't um, understood very well with previous exploration programs. I'd say that started to change in 2017 and 2018. Um, when a silver standard optioned the SIB property and conducted a 20,000 meter drill program. Uh, this again was focusing on the contact mudstone or the SK Creek horizon, which you may have heard me um, discuss in some of my technical presentations. However, what we found is that um, a lot of these showings do not occur just in the contact mudstone or that SK Creek horizon. And that was actually a big reason a lot of the showings on our property really weren't considered worth following up on because they just didn't fit the SK Creek model. Well, that's part of our new interpretation is that, you know, we're not really looking for an SK Creek model. We're looking for a precious metal rich VMS. Uh, so we need the VMS model. And that really opens up the prospectivity when you really have a comprehensive understanding of uh, just how widespread these VMS deposits can be. 
Um, so what we've found is that they're um, located within the Hazelton Group stratigraphy. Again, this has been the most prospective uh, stratigraphy uh, for the past 30 years, but it really wasn't until uh, the 2020 program that uh, we understood that we're dealing with stacked VMS deposits that occur uh, both within the upper Hazelton group, which you see in the yellow, as well as the lower Hazelton group, which is in the green on this map. And uh, that these deposits occur along uh, the limbs of anticlines or uh, big folds and the Earth's crust. And this is very important to understand exactly how these deposits are distributed on the property and how to trace the, uh, the right stratigraphy uh, to find um, more of these deposits. So John, I think this is a key point is because you guys are called SK Mining, a lot of people are just carrying it over to the SK Creek property and saying, is this another SK Creek? What I'm hearing is that this is somewhat different geology when it comes to a VMS deposit, then what do you like to see in the drill core? What are the elements? What else can you tell us about when you know you're onto a VMS deposit? Well, the, the biggest vector is hydrothermal alteration. Um, and that's something that- Can you that simplify can, that for us all, please? <laughs> oh, well, when a, when a hydrothermal or a hot fluid flows through a rock, it's in chemical dis disequilibrium. But so it basically means it's going to chemically interact with that rock. I mean, I, perhaps a lot of people know about putting um, baking soda and vinegar together and there's a reaction. Well, you can have the similar sort of mineral reactions or chemical reactions within a rock. And it's uh, these really hot fluids that form the VMS deposit that do this hydrothermal alteration. And um, typically the alteration associated with these deposits is, has a lot larger footprint than uh, the actual deposit itself. So it allows you to vector towards uh, these deposits just by looking at the hydrothermal alteration. Um, so that's one thing we can do to vector towards a deposit in the field. Um, again, a lot of the um, work that we've uh, been doing over the past um, few years has been putting together a better stratigraphic framework and correcting some of um, the, the, the geological inconsistencies on uh, previous maps, but we've really come up with a good solid exploration model now. And uh, as I'll explain, we're going to be doing a quite extensive mapping program uh, to really resolve some of the issues on the existing geological maps. Okay, thank you. So, I, and this is what I, I've been mentioning over the last two, years, three years or so, uh, we've done a, a pretty thorough data review on the property. And that's um, when I noticed that, you know, some of the work that had been done in the past was suspect at best. And we needed to actually get out there and look at some of the historic drill core. Um, and once I did that, I a picture started to emerge that we've got several favorable horizons for these VMS deposits. It's not just Eskate Creek but there's actually six prospective horizons that we've identified so far within the Hazelton group. And that was one of the first big revelations from our data review and historic core logging. Uh, but it was also during that process that um, we identified the TV and Jeff showings as probably the, the lowest hanging fruit on the property. They certainly seem to be textbook VMS deposits um, and that was the model that we went in um, exploring these things with was that they were a stacked VMS system. Um, and something that we found looking at these is that they exhibit a lot of what we want to see in a VMS. As you would ask, Corey, we were looking for hydrothermal alteration, but we're also looking for the right types of volcanic rocks, um, the right types of sedimentary rocks that tell us we're in a seafloor position. And then we want to know um, if we're next to a, what we call a synvolcanic feeder structure. This is a fault zone uh, that would have fed the hydrothermal system that created these VMS deposits. And there's a lot of um, geological detail that goes into synthesizing all of this and identifying the right paleo environment. But what we found at TV and Jeff is, yes, we do have all the hallmarks of 
um, a VMS deposit. And uh, it's starting to look like we've actually got quite a large uh, VMS system. It's not just TV and Jeff, but the entire um, region surrounding these appears to be one larger hydrothermal system. So that's, you know, sort of what the past few years of exploration really uh, developed was this district scale um, throughout the entire Hazelton Group exploration model for these VMS deposits. And uh, particularly at TV and Jeff um, seems to have paid off because we've had some quite good drill intercepts uh, from uh, particularly the 2021 program. Uh, which we did 23,500 uh, meters between TV and Jeff with um, some other drilling at the C-10 and Vermilion uh, prospects further to the south. Um, we also conducted a property-wide sky tim survey. Um, this was something we did a, a limited survey of, of an, um, 2020 of just the TV and Jeff region, but uh, we saw that the data was showing us some pretty good evidence uh, that we have um, conductivity anomalies associated with these hydrothermal systems, as well as uh, the data highlighting a lot of the major geological structures. Um, and then a lot of our follow-up uh, work in 2020 followed up on our uh, 2020 BLEG survey, or bulk leach extractable gold survey, which identified several good prospect around the property noted in uh, these reds and the purple color, even the oranges on this map to the right um, are pretty good showings. And this is something we started to explore last year at Scarlet Ridge and Vermilion. Um, and we're going to be doing it even more this year, as I'll, I'll talk about. We're going to try to visit every single one of these bleg anomalies this year. Okay, so one other point here, John, is that a lot of that drilling last year was focused at TV and Jeff. How much was put into Vermilion and the other target? We got about a thousand meters okay. over so at Vermilion and about 2,500 meters or so over at, at C10, which okay. we gained valuable information from those that we'll be able to use this year to help improve our understanding of that area. We down there. Just so people know, we hit a, a brick wall at mid-September. It started snowing to the point where we couldn't carry on, so we had to cut the program short. We were aiming for thirty thousand meters. Uh, we got twenty, little under twenty-four hundred or twenty-four thousand then. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, you know, I'd say TV and Jeff are bona fide a volcanogenic massive sulfide um, mineralization. Uh, we can see these cross sections that I have here, um, and if people have been paying attention to the press releases, uh, we have multiple stratigraphic horizons um, between uh, TV and Jeff, uh, where we have, um, starting up at the top at TV, we have our um, upper stock work zone, which underlies a newly discovered massive sulfide um, intervals. Uh, but this stock work zone is where a lot of our really long uh, intervals of gold and um, quite high grade silver mineralization are located. And it's that stock work zone that would be feeding the seafloor um, mineralization. Uh, and then we have a lower um, massive sulfide zone uh, that would be over to the, the left, uh, lower left side of this um, diagram of TV. And uh, we have good evidence now that, that that's actually underlain by another stock work uh, system that we will be exploring more this year. And then going to Jeff, which is about 1.4 kilometers north of TV, uh, we have an upper stock work uh, zone. It would be the upper right part of this image with Jeff. And we can stratigraphically correlate that with the lower um zone at TV. Those are in the exact same rocks right there. So we know that Jeff is stratigraphically below TV, which actually opens up prospectivity for more um, feeder style mineralization um, uh, down section at TV, as well as more uh, mineralization up section at Jeff uh, that would be correlative with uh, the upper zone at TV. But we've had um, pretty consistent long intervals of gold and silver grade at TV. And then at Jeff, we have these um, 
pods of very high grade gold, bonanza grade gold, as you can see this um, large um, sample over here. Uh, this has 79.2 grams per ton gold and 203 grams per ton silver over uh, about a half a meter or so, 60 centimeters. And we have several intercepts like that at, at Jeff. Um, and it's important to note that both of these um, deposits are still open along strike, down, dip, and up section. And that's really the name of the game uh, for uh, what we're going to be doing uh, this and, year. And John, real quick, uh, I saw a question come in as you're drilling an intersect and exhale of shredded by massive sulfide. Why don't you, why don't you point that out to folks while, while we're in that slide? Yep. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have, um, let me make sure this, uh, whiteboard, if I can draw, uh, yeah, you'll be able to draw. Okay. Uh, get the pencil. That's not, doesn't seem to be doing anything. Where are you trying to draw here? On the TV. Okay. Uh, but to answer the, the question, we, we encountered two exhalative horizons at um, TV, uh, one overlying the uh, upper stock work zone, that upper right part of the TV. Um, we inter intercepted our uh, exhalative horizon there, as well as our second one um, on that lower massive sulfide zone at TV. And in both cases, there are stock work. Um, feeder systems feeding into these um, exhaled of horizons. Curiously, at Jeff, we really haven't encountered any um, massive sulfide or unequivocal exhaled of seafloor horizon massive sulfide yet. It, to date, all the drillings really intercepted intensely altered stockwork style mineralization, uh, which means possibly that we're still, um, we need to find uh, where the actual uh, venting occurred. Uh, for this deposit, it could be a long strike or down dip. We have to think in um, three dimensions uh, and, when we're exploring for these. And while we're on this topic, I'm going to throw one more thing out. So at TV, what, what you were saying, and just a little bit more detail there, if you look at the cross section, you can see some of the uppermost holes where they've hit red, red and even white. White is actually the highest grade. That is where that exhalative part of the system has been identified, okay? And it was identified late in the season. It was actually encountered in some of the last holes. They were stepping up, mm -hmm. up the hill as they drilled last year, and those were some of the last holes that were drilled early September. What's important about that exhalative horizon is wide open down dip along strike that was really a discovery that was made almost at the end of the season and was not followed up on yet. So I, I think there's a very good chance we can ex expand upon that exhalative horizon. And I think it, it should extend, you know, knowing the nature of VMS, it should extend well uh, down dip and in and out of the section. So that's an exciting target in its own right. Uh, then at Jeff, the thing I would comment is, you know, John's com uh, point about it all being stock work to this point is, is accurate. That begs the question, where is the VMS? Where's the exhalative part of the system? And now what's intriguing is at Jeff, uh, there are some very, very high grades, uh, some, you know, relatively s small or narrow intercepts in the stock work that are very high grade. There's a, a few that are bigger. You know, there was, I think, a 36 meter interval of a little over 10 grams uh, in the 2020 season. Okay, now that's that gold rich, that Nanza grade stuff. If we find the exhalative to that, you know, then that likely, in my view, could be, you know, analogous to the SKE Creek type deposit. Either, either one of these, okay? They're, they're very high grade. Uh, SK Creek, don't forget, it had lots of silver. It was 46 gram gold, but it also had 2.2 kilograms of silver per ton, life of mine. Okay, look at the numbers on these tables. You can see right away that we have very, very high grades, predominantly in the stock work. A little bit of these uh, numbers are from the VMS that was encountered late in the season. But it's telling us, it's telling us that the grade is certainly, uh, the grade potential is certainly there. And that once we find and, and kind of flesh out that uh, exhalative part of the system, you know, we could end up finding uh, an SK Creek too. So, Quentin, to that point, too, another question just came in asking if you have any drill pads at Jeff 
that are targeting the exhalatives that you weren't uh, able to. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to spoil John's punchline. Okay. He has some slides later yeah. that show people we're going to drill the absolute crap out of this place. Okay. How about big um, picture? Any uh, chance of combining TV and Jeff here? That you, right there, this slide, it's a little, little fuzzy there, John. I don't know. We might have to tweak the pixel uh, thing on it, but uh, this, this slide speaks to it. So, John, take her away. Show people what we're going to do. Yep. So, yeah, it's quite a notice, or uh, this slide is a bit blurry for some reason. But uh, what our program this season is doing is to really expand um, the strike length of exploration at both TV and Jeff. Uh, as I mentioned, and Quentin mentioned, they're both open along strike, down dip, um, up and down stratigraphic section. So, uh, what we've done, uh, part of the 2021 program, uh, was to do an extensive soil sampling um, grid over uh, TV and Jeff and to try to connect these two. And uh, our press release in late March highlighted a lot of this, um, the data, in particular what this um, figure is showing up in this north part of Jeff, um, which is this northern box of this upper white box uh, on this figure there's quite a large um, anomaly of a silver anomaly uh, in the soil samples here that not only encompasses Jeff but extends to the south of Jeff and well to the north of Jeff um, and then uh, as you'll see on um, the next few slides uh, we actually have our IP or induced polarization data uh, from the 2020 season um, combined with these um, soil samples and the stratigraphic information we've been able to develop from our uh, drill program over the last two years and really being able to um, define some targets using these um, data. Uh, so again, we're going to be using resistivity anomalies from our IP survey uh, because uh, what we can see is that resistivity is really tracking with hydrothermal alteration. So again, that hydrothermal alteration vector I talked about um, is really uh, showing up on our resistivity data and as well as our uh, pathfinder elements. So silver, arsenic, and mercury are associated with gold and silver mineralization, not only at TV and Jeff and every other um, VMS showing on our property, but also at SK Creek. Uh, these are pathfinder elements for uh, our precious metal mineralization. And then again, our uh, SkyTim uh, survey has been very helpful for um, putting a lot of the uh, geological context uh, to the areas that we don't have adequate mapping yet. John, before you leave yep. that, I want to talk about it, okay, because I think it's really important people understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so the, the white box in the north, that's Jeff. The white box in the south, that's TV. You can see there's about two kilometers between them. Uh, so there's a lot of open ground between. There's also soils that extend to the south of TV, but also to the north of Jeff. So in total, we did soils over about five and a half or six kilometers of strike along this eastern side of the anticline, and it's showing us lots of anomalism. All those little black lines that you see there are planned drill holes that uh, we sort, uh, John and his team have sorted out and we reviewed yesterday. Those are the drill drill holes uh, that will be completed or you know, hopefully mostly or all this season. Uh, what they are is they're fences of holes, okay? So, so the, the holes are angled predominantly back to the west, and we drill a succession of holes uh, such that there's, you know, they they overlap one another. Think of them like, a, you know, fence pickets, but slightly tilted on their side. That way we make sure that we catch any mineralization that's dipping, you know, to the east through this area. And if we hit on these areas to the north of Jeff, in between TB and Jeff, to the south, and we, we can demonstrate that this five or six kilometers has more mineralization in it than, than just the TB and Jeff systems, you know, to put it in context, that is is nearly twice the size of the footprint of the, the SK Creek system, okay? If you go to Skeena's Maps, you can look at their website, you can see the distribution of gold deposits that they have up and down the west side of the anticline up further to the north. It's about 13K to the north of here. And you'll see that the, the footprint of mineralization is about maybe three and a half kilometers 
uh, along strike. It's in pods. It's not all one continuous sheet by any stretch. There are several pods that are all kind of strung together like a string of pearls, and that's very typical of EMS deposits. We think we have a similar uh, string of, of pearls here. Those little blister-like features where you see uh, reds and oranges uh, pop up, uh, those are SkyTem anomalies that we think are conductive features likely associated with sulfide. Okay, you can see there's a, a great number of these little blisters of pimples uh, sh popping up there. And we we want to test every single one of them, basically. If, if we find uh, that there's multiple VMS, you know, multiple pods and whatnot up and down this strike, yeah, we, we this could be a very, very good ending. Another point, last point I will make here, most people uh, don't, know the history of SK Creek. They don't even really know about the mine. It was the highest grade mine on earth, guys, for a long time. It was the highest grade operating mine, a gold mine on planet earth. It had a head grade of 46 grams life of mine. Uh, it also had 2.2 kilograms of silver life of mine. But the tonnage was quite small. It was at maybe two, two and a half million tons at the end of the day. It produced, I think, 3.3 million ounces of gold and uh, many, many, like 160 million ounces of silver of memory serves. But look, Skeena now has 40 or 50 million tons of material that surrounds that, that, that higher grade deposit. And, you know, if you, if you look at that holistically, like look at the whole system, yes, the SK Creek deposit, the original wonderful, wonderful cherry uh, of a deposit, it was, it was in there in the midst of all of that, uh, lower grade stuff, but uh, you know, collectively today, I mean, that's that's remarkable. It's a, if you take Skeena's plus the historic, you've got probably 10 million ounces of gold mine resource and reserves, and and then umpteen, I don't know how many ounces of silver. It's got to be you know two or three hundred million ounces of silver. We could have the very same thing here, guys. This is we're we're swinging for the fence. We're going to drill up and down the strike of this thing for five or six kilometers. We are going to try to demonstrate we have such a target right here. Thank you, Quentin. That is very interesting. Let me jump in here real quick because, look, there are a lot of comparisons being made. And quite frankly, it was grade, too, that was carrying SK Creek. In terms of the grade that you guys have drilled, you already mentioned some of the silver. How has the grade compared then, Quentin? Uh, we see at, at TV, it seems to be differential uh, differentially high in silver okay you see really high numbers like bonanza levels in fact i think 5000 ppm 5 kilograms of silver in one of the intervals last year up at jeff we see really super high grade gold you know Je uh, john showed a picture of 79 gram sample there uh interestingly uh you see the same kind of phenomenon if you go to skina's data and you look at sk creek for what it is, you know, it was not one homogenous deposit, okay, not by any stretch. There were places that were silver rich, mm -hmm. there were places that were gold rich, there were places where silver and gold overlap. We're seeing the same kind of thing here, very, very little difference between uh, this and SK Creek. I think, I think we're going to see the same phenomena here. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Let's get into the drill program because we have a lot of questions on that as well. Yep, so I, I won't belabor the geological models too much, but we after the last two years of drilling, we've been able to put together good uh, geological models of both TV and Jeff. Uh, we're located, as I said, along our synvolcanic fault structure. We've got our mineralization, our hydrothermal alteration, our volcanic rocks, everything that we want to see to have um, a VMS deposit. And, uh, and, you know, now we have these models that's going to help us extrapolate uh, the geology along strike into areas that we have not explored. And uh, part of the way we're doing that is with our induced polarization data. Um, and here, uh, what we see on the left is our um, IP line uh, from 7900 north at Jeff. This is resistivity. Again, I'm choosing resistivity because that's really highlighting our hydrothermal alteration, which um, if you see these yellow blobs that are kind of hugging all the drill holes in both of these figures, that is um, what we've modeled uh, as intense hydrothermal alteration. We use our geochemical data uh, to basically quantify the alteration intensity. And what we see is that hydrothermal alteration correlates with resistivity anomalies, as well as our mineralization or our gold grade. Um, and we see this where we um, 
have our uh, current drilling, but then we can extrapolate that out uh, to where we don't have any drill holes, uh, like here uh, north of TV. These are um, drill um, holes or cross sections with these black lines on it. Those are planned drill holes well to the north of TV that will be intercepting these resistivity anomalies. Uh, and late in this season, uh, we were drilling TV 2181. Uh, we did intercept uh, sulfide stock work within that. Unfortunately, it uh, didn't run uh, with any appreciable gold or silver. However, it was quite high in arsenic. Um, so that's one of our Pathfinder elements. And if uh, we look up section from TV 2181 here on this left-hand image, uh, if you go just up uh, to the upper uh, left of that hole, we have a planned drill hole that's intercepting a resistivity anomaly that is um, just up dip from TV 2181. And then, as I said, there's a whole host of other resistivity anomalies, most of which lie along strike from known mineralization. Um, same thing uh, with Jeff right here. Uh, this is These are both to the south of Jeff. And interestingly, what we see, um, these little dots that are up to the tops of these images, those are our soil samples taken on the surface. And what we see in a lot of cases is that our higher grade soil anomalies correspond to our resistivity anomalies. So that again, is lending more support to our target um, criteria of going after combination of soil anomalies, our resistivity anomalies, and uh, looking at our SkyTim data uh, along strike and really being able to correlate these um, anomalies with known mineralization and it continues along strike. This is a four and a half kilometer strike length that we'll be testing with uh, drilling as well as um, getting some more refined um, soil information even further um, outboard from TV and Jeff. Um, but, you know, I think it's really compelling that we see these resistivity anomalies uh, continuing a long strike and these very large strike lengths of um, very strong uh, silver anomalies, as well as arsenic and mercury anomalies as well. Uh, so going back to Quentin's point, um, you know, if we're going to be testing this full strike length, and there's the potential that we could have a footprint of a, a large hydrothermal system that is twice the footprint of the SK Creek deposit. And that's really the um, primary goal of this season is to push the extents of this area because it seems to be quite well mineralized. And we have a lot of surface samples that we reported on in March that uh, show gold grade from uh, rock samples as well as intense hydrothermal alteration to the north of uh, Jeff. What we also see with our soil data is that these uh, pathfinder anomalies aren't closed in at all. So we have to go in and do more soil sampling this year and really fill in the gaps in our data and try to um, close in these anomalies. And one thing I'd like to point out, if you look at um, the SkyTim image up towards the very top, just um, to the, the left of the kind of arsenic PPM scale bar, there's a big uh, red conductive protrusion going into the center of the field near the top. That is a, another large SkyTim anomaly that uh, seems to be very much of the same morphology as what we're seeing at TV and Jeff. And I think it's interesting, some of the fault zones that we're starting to delineate as our feeder structures have the same orientation or basically bisect right down the middle of these um, larger uh, protrusion shaped sky tim anomalies. So we'll be doing uh, quite a bit of soil sampling, actually uh, collecting uh, soil over a nine kilometer strike length to see just how big this system actually is. And we're going to be flexible enough with our drilling that if we see things that we like uh, well to the north of Jeff uh, with our handheld XRF and our soil data and uh, field prospecting, we'll be able to drill targets, newly identified targets this year. Okay, that's key. Yeah. And I think you just answered a number of questions that came in with that, uh, with the last couple of slides. Is it the soil anomaly, soil samples, 
are lining up with a lot of the uh, SkyTem work, right? So this yeah. is going to be a key targeting tool that's also continuing this year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. and again, note, it lines up with our IP data as well. We have about 10 minutes left here, guys. John, if you could go yep. through Scarlet Ridge and, and uh, Vermilion and the rest of this real quick. Yep. Let's leave about five minutes. Uh, you know, Corey can yeah, ask for a couple, couple of quick questions. questions here. A lot of people are wondering big picture stuff, too. So let's talk about some of these other targets yep. and then so, we'll get into it. I'll run through this very quickly. We have a couple of uh, bigger picture targets we're going after uh, Scarlet Ridge and uh, Vermilion. Uh, so Scarlet Ridge is up in the uh, northeastern. Uh, bleg anomalies and then vermilion uh, we drilled last year is down in the south um so i'll go over to scarlet ridge this is just a phenomenal area of just outcropping vms mineralization it's uh, quite poorly explored um there was some drilling done to the south uh, west back in 1990 but in short we're seeing the same geological uh, features and rock types and alteration that we expect to have associated with VMS. And importantly, uh, these rocks at Scarlet Ridge are in the upper Hazleton group. So they are at the Eskate Creek uh, stratigraphic level. So we'll be doing an extensive mapping program at Scarlet Ridge, basically mapping out this entire eastern anticline. Uh, the existing geologic um, maps and interpretations are... Um, incorrect based on uh, more detailed investigations from last season and we'll be uh, doing a very uh, rigorous mapping program at Scarlet Ridge um, pretty much an entire eight kilometer of strike length and if we identify any targets during this mapping program we will be drilling those this year um, reserving approximately 5,000 meters or so um, if we find targets that, that we really uh, find compelling this year. Um, there's been some exploration in the past further to the southwest of Scarlet Ridge uh, where there's quite a number of um, gold-bearing surface samples as well as uh, drill holes called the AP drill holes, which did intercept uh, some gold mineralization over a few meters. Um, it's important to note a lot of this area was glaciated uh, when it was explored previously, and there's a lot of newly exposed ground because of glacial retreat, as uh, you can kind of see right here with this unexplored area right here is newly exposed because of recent glacial retreat. So we have quite a large strike length over at uh, Scarlet Ridge on the eastern anticline that's going to be a, probably the biggest focus for our mapping um, uh, efforts. Uh, we're also going to be doing more mapping at uh, Vermilion and the Spearhead area because we do have a six kilometer trend of uh, bleg anomalies. It's a very rugged area, um, very high elevation, so a short uh, time frame within which to explore this area. And we'll be uh, doing more characterization of the geology and identifying uh, more VMS style uh, targets in the field. Uh, for this year, but our, our drilling uh, will mostly be focused at TV and Jeff and at Scarlet Ridge. Um, we we'll probably won't be doing uh, drilling at Vermilion this year unless we see something that's extremely uh, compelling for us. But nonetheless, it's a very prospective area. So outside of TV and Jeff, any of these new areas, do you need drill permits or are permits in place? Uh, we're, we're fully permitted now okay. uh, at Scarlet Ridge. Uh, Vermilion, TV and Jeff, the whole quarry area, uh, we are fully permitted on the entire property, actually. So we can pretty much drill wherever we want to now, which really opens up our flexibility to do um, what we want. So okay. let's talk um, about this district scale potential. Also tie it into key catalysts then for this year, your main goals around the drilling for this year's program. Well, uh, th this year's program TV and Jeff, we're going to be doing a minimum of 25,000 meters at TV and Jeff. We really want to hit that full four and a half kilometer or more strike length and really start to define the true size of this system. Uh, this is, you know, as as big as it seems to be with our soil and IP data, then that, that could be a, a major discovery. So that's our, our big um Focus as well as developing some of this other area right around TV and Jeff. We have other targets 
um, on the west side of the anticline, the Excelsior targets and some other um, compelling bleg and soil anomalies down there that we'll be getting boots on the ground here within a couple of weeks, actually, um, and doing prospecting to develop more early season targets. Um, so that, that's an important thing to note. We are uh, mobilizing and my team, advanced team, we're leaving on Sunday to go up to the field. We'll be at camp by May 20th and we'll have our boots on the ground um, doing this prospecting, you know, getting our drill pads and everything um, refurbished and new ones built uh, by the end of the month. Uh, we've had a he helicopter flyover that shows that our lower elevation areas are already snow free. So that, that's our huge plus uh, to getting, you know, basically a three week head start on drilling compared to last year, which is going to allow us to be this ambitious. And then again, that mapping programs will help us develop new targets um, around the property with a solid geological interpretation. Um, and then we're going to have a dedicated prospecting team that will go around and visit all of these bleg anomalies and really start to characterize uh, new emerging targets this season. So there's going to be a lot of new target development, as well as just pushing the boundaries on TV and Jeff uh, very aggressively. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of uh, other exploration, true exploration as well. Since you are planning on starting this drill program a bit earlier, uh, Quentin or John, assay turnaround time there's been yeah, a dozen let, questions let, come in let's, uh, you guys let's talk about it? that that's a good question there Corey, because uh it was a challenge last year and it's it really been a challenge for the past two years you know fortunately covid uh hassles are lifting i'm not going to say that it's going to be easier here they, now the biggest challenge is you have a lot of companies well cashed up who have aggressive programs in the golden triangle and elsewhere in this region and and those labs are going to have a lot of samples coming in so one of the two of the things we've talked about firstly uh we're going to to be we're going to as as we saw and sample the core we're going to identify the most uh, promising parts of drill holes and submit those samples in as a priority uh like in all of the samples we ship we're going to send them in priority we're also secondly going to work with the lab to make sure they don't just pile the, the mm -hmm. samples up in their yard in a chaotic mix like they did last year. And and that was the other thing that really hamstrung mm -hmm. the assay turnaround was that we were getting little bits and pieces of assays from, you know, a multitude of drill holes, and we weren't getting the entire string of assays for any given hole so that we could report it. And it took, you know, it took a while to kind of get the lab, uh, work with the lab to get that all coordinated. So I think between sending out samples in a priority uh, form from the, the camp and then working with the lab to make sure they don't get, you know, they don't just get heaved in a pile. Uh, those are the, the two most important things. Now, you know, uh, best laid plans, right? Um, look, we will do our darndest to make sure that this doesn't happen, but, uh, you know, labs are labs and unfortunately, uh, you know, things can happen. So hopefully we can avert most of them, but no promises. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Quentin, wrap us up then with what your goals are. You're the technical advisor here in terms of the drill program for this year. John's laid out the program where it's a focus a lot on TV and Jeff, but then there's all these other areas that you might drill that you need to do soil samples on. Where do you want the company to end this year after the exploration program? Yeah. After this program, obviously at TV and Jeff, we want to see uh, more pods or bodies of mineralization up up and down that corridor that we talked about earlier. If we do, then I think people will recognize, yeah, we do have the potential to find an SK Creek scale system. It would also be nice, uh, you know, to to see that high grade uh, kind of crystallize. We did see a, a snippet of it in some of the, the drill holes last year. If we see, you know, if we, as we chase that thing down, dip and long strike, if we see that, that, exhale the horizon where there was very high grade expand that would be a huge win you know but in short we want to find a replicate or even bigger of sk creek so there's there's the first objective uh, and that would be through the tv jeff corridor second objective is to identify new vms systems and scarlet ridge obviously is a very important area for us it was found late in the season last year but uh with our plans with with Ben and his team and John supervising and getting out there and hitting it hard, I think we can get a, a few drill holes in this year that hopefully point to another VMS discovery up there. 
uh, down at Excelsior, which we didn't talk too much about, but is on the west side of the anticline, mm -hmm. uh, directly opposite of TV and Jeff. It looks like we have another TV and Jeff system forming there. We planted these soils up and down that area. Uh, you know, you take TV and Jeff and, and duplicate it. Okay, that's another possible win for us. You know, uh, there's other areas that are going to prospect, like John mentioned, uh, down there at Vermilion and C10. A lot of people say, why aren't you more aggressive down there? Well, that, that country is very high. Okay, so it's not practical to get a huge amount of work done uh, early in the season. You can't, you have to wait until the snow melts. So, uh, you know, we, they will do their darndest once the snow melts to get up there, evaluate targets, maybe test one or two, but uh, that's unfortunately got to be a, a lesser priority given that we have a lot of low hanging fruit to tackle right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. Everybody, if you have follow up questions, there's an email address there that you can email. You can also email me directly, fleck at kereport.com. Sounds like this is going to be a very busy year for the company with drills hitting the ground. Sounds like as soon as possible. So yeah. uh, look, a lot of targets being tested, a lot of exploration potential here. And that at least has been something that the market has shown some interest in for these tough market times. So Quentin, John, thank you again very much for your time, guys. I'm sure we'll be doing another one or two of these throughout the years. Some drill results start to come in. But in the meantime, keep us all up to date on the news. And everybody who tuned in, thank you all for taking time out of your day and for sending in your questions. Thank you, Corey. Thanks.